fun. Now, I know I'm not famous like some of these other people, and even like my university isn't very famous, unless you're really into football yes, in the United States. <laughs> USC, fight on. <laughs> um, but I, I am the wife of Jason Gregory of Naughty Dog, so at least, you know, by association, you, you, you have to like me, right? <laughs> Because a lot of you came for his talk, I think. <laughs> so just so you kind of know where I come from, I've been a software engineer at least since 1993. Kind of tells you my age, but that's OK. Um, I've been teaching specifically iOS programming. So I come from a software engineering background, teaching Objective-C to college students like yourselves since um, 2009. <laughs> Um, I also, now at our, at our university, we have a minor in mobile, app, mobile application development, which I developed all the curriculum for and teach the major classes. We have so many now that I have other professors that teach as well. Um, but it's really exciting, I think, to have, you know, these are, this is for undergrads. So to teach undergrads how to do mobile app development such that they can get kick-ass jobs when they graduate, right? Isn't that what you want? Either kick-ass jobs or starting your own company right? That's what you want. So that's, that's I feel like, our goal is um, in, in our department at USC is to really, um, you know, teach students really practical skills. Um, so like I said, I teach for uh, USC University of Southern California for the Viterbi School of Engineering. Shout that out just, just in case people from my school are watching on the live feed. Um, <laughs> so really, I'm here. Um, like I said, I teach all different kinds of mobile app development classes from really geeky iOS programming, advanced iOS programming. We also have Android programming and uh, you know, for Mac mobile forensics and all kinds of classes like that. But I really hope you, know, you go away with this um, just encouraging you to develop mobile apps and learning some of the process that we go through for developing mobile apps. So it's not specifically geared just to engineers or just computer scientists. I want, I'm covering some of the business side of mobile apps. So you guys remember that it's important to think about these aspects when you're developing your apps. So just, that's kind of where I'm coming from. Um, there are, as you know, lots of success success stories for developing mobile apps, people that have started companies, you know, draw something at the very, you know, that was their last big push to do the draw something app, right? They were running out of money. And of course, then it was hugely popular. So you know some of the, the major stories that have made a lot of money. I also wanted to mention, <laughs> I love, you're blocking. <laughs> I also wanted to mention startups. Um, so I've had students uh, that either took classes from me or um, ended up being my TAs, which were awesome, um, that were really successful. Uh, one of them is DancePad. There's a group of students. Uh, we also at our, at our university have a degree in computer science games. And uh, they started developing, they'd taken my iOS class. They were in a games class, and they developed this dance pad. So it was for the iPad, and you were dancing, following along with music. Um, they did it while in college, while in university. They continued it, and then eventually sold it to a company. So they sold it to a producer. So they, they at least made money, and they got really good jobs afterwards as well. So it helped, right? Um, and then on the, the startup side, more really on the startup side, is Embark. So uh, David Hodge was a student at USC. He was my TA. He was awesome. Um, but he developed iBART, which was a mobile app for the BART system, the Bay Area Rapid Transit. So kind of like your metro, right? The Bay Area Rapid Transit. He started doing that back in 2000, right when Apple kind of opened up their um, iOS, right? They opened up the, 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 you know, the iOS SDK, Software Development Kit, and from the get-go, and then it was three people, so three students at USC together, got together, did this app, continued it, made it such that they could do other metro apps. So they did one for like New York bus systems, other metro apps, uh, like in Chicago and Boston, and they created a company called Embark, and to develop these specializing in metro apps. And eventually, uh, their success story was they got bought out by Apple. So, which they did well. 
So, <laughs> as you can imagine. Um, because they were really good at mapping all of that. And that was something, if you remember from the iOS apps, or the iOS map, metros weren't in those in the beginning at all. So they took all of their stuff to be able to do that. So they, they've done really well. So whether you want to start your own company, whether you want to find a job in the industry, you know, this, there's a lot of possibilities. And what I love about it is that you can have a small group of students come together, make a, make a great app or make a startup together and really be successful. You don't have to belong to a big company, right? Which is, which is very exciting, I think. So first of all, what is mobile, right? Do most of you think you focus on like the mobile devices, right? And all their capabilities, right? That's, is that what you think about when you think about mobile, maybe? Yes. Yeah, right? You think about the different mobile devices? No. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> really, wait, see, I thought I'd get a laugh. Good. Um, <laughs> fundamentally, when we think about mobile, we really need to think about our users. The fact that our users could be mobile, right? They could be standing in a line somewhere. They could be sitting in class. <laughs> I know my students sit in class and go look on their mobile phones. I know, I know. Um, you, and probably now, even now, you're you know, sitting, looking at some app, right? Um, <laughs> so really, when we talk about mobile, we really need to focus on our users, right? So there's a, a book called Designing the Mobile User Experience by Barbara Ballard, and she really focuses on, fundamentally, mobile refers to the user and not the device or the application. So keep that in mind when you're designing apps, right? It's about the user. The users could be anywhere. They could be mobile, they could be using their mobile, your app, anywhere, right? So, something to think about. So, my goal here really is, right, to get you from, hey, right, you all have app ideas, right? Raise your hand, you got app ideas. How can you not, right? You, you're, you're, you're engineers, you wanna improve the world or at least improve your own situation and you see things that are done inefficiently, right? That's what we do as engineers, right? We look at things and go, why would we do it that way? There's a better way to do it, right? There's an app for that. So that's, I wanna take you from like, hey, I have a great idea to really a successful app, to go through the different steps, right? So we're gonna start with your app idea, your honing in on your user profile, your app definition statement, which is a very forgotten step, I must say, um, your design, and then development. And actually, I should really add on because afterwards I also talk about marketing, advertising, um, analytics, that kind of stuff too. So you'll notice that I'm really trying to hit this kind of the business side of making apps with some really technical stuff thrown in there as well for you guys. So first of all, when it comes to app ideas, I want you to think big, right? Think big, think what do you want, what is it that you, know, you wanna do? And I'm a big one on finding a need and filling it, right? Is there something that bothers you every day that you think an app would fix? That you could say, oh, whether it's managing your own schedule or I know having looked at all the, um, the innovation awards, right? Because it was using the Phoenix API, right? Your school schedules, all that kind of stuff, right? You know, finding a need and filling it, saying where, where is there, there a hole there? And it doesn't have to be necessarily for school, but it could be in any, any kind of area, right? And it, say you have something special in your life that, that makes it a little bit different. Think about what, how you could help other people in the same situation. Um, individually, I mean, we, we talk about whether you individually want to develop an idea. Make sure that you ask your family and friends if they think it's a really good idea, right? You're getting feedback. Um, I do like working in small groups because you can bounce off ideas, right? When you're a single individual and you say, I have this idea and I'm gonna do everything myself, then you're not opening up yourself for some good feedback, okay? So I really do recommend, if you can, working in small groups, like three to five people, I think is really optimal. There's a lot of different hot areas nowadays in mobile apps, as you might have heard, hopefully, um, especially, um, 
Personally, I do some work with the Keck School of Medicine, with the Body Computing, the Center for Body Computing, and wearables is just a big, big industry, especially in the United States, I'm assuming here as well. Anyone heard of like the Fitbit, right? Oh, oh, do you have one on? Yes, look at someone even has one on, yes! Like the Fitbit, the Nike Fuel Band, the Misfit Wearables Shine. Actually, the Misfit Wearables guys are really cool, by the way. I've met them and they're really cool. Uh, Sony Smart Band, something like that. These kind of wearables, right? So they take your heart rate, they do your, how much you're exercising. There's ones that uh, have apps associated with it, like Map My Run, right? All that kind of stuff, right? So medical health, well, in the United States, we're not, I don't think, nearly as healthy as I've seen people in Portugal. So good for you, bad for us. <laughs> but I, I just, in general, I just, the Portugal, it's been very impressed. Um, so, you know, here is just a, a, a graphic here that shows some of the, you know, very popular wearable apps, but this is a really great area that's developing. Uh, so I work with the Center for Body Computing, and um, there's a company called LiveCore that we've partnered with, and they make an iPhone case that does uh, an EKG and a heart rate. So right now, uh oh, if I'm going to do this and, and it's going to be really high, I just know it. <laughs> so. I can, if you can kind of see here, it's just an iPhone case, and it, they have Android as well. I haven't <laughs> forgot about the Android people. But I can get an EKG and my heart rate. Yeah, really, really high. Very embarrassing. <laughs> there you go. So there's all these great stuff out there, and then we get to develop apps with it. So we worked on one where we were getting heart rate and then putting our heart rate on images and posting it to Instagram and Facebook and stuff like that. So it's kind of fun, right? Sharing all that. Share your heart rate with everyone. <laughs> so, that, you know, and people, well, you know, does, don't you have friends that do Map My Run? Does anyone? Yeah, right? They're like, look at I ran five miles today and this is where I went, right? I mean, this whole fitness, that, that's very encouraging, actually, right? These are encouraging to get people exercising. So that, that is just a big market. There's other ones as well. But when it comes to your app idea, like I said, find out what you're interested in and really go for it. User profile, we need to figure out who our target audience is, whether it be, might be an age range, you know, a type of person, something, where they're located, whatever it may be, ask questions about who you think your target audience is. Figure out your user profile. Remember, users are our most important, right? They're the ones who's going to either download your app and pay for it, or somehow we make money from users using our app. So we need to make sure that we target it correctly to our audience. Um, and we also want to look at our competitors. So what other apps are there out there that may be similar to our ideas, but what are they doing you know, what are users not getting from them? What would make ours special? What would make ours different? What's our, quote, secret sauce, right? What, what makes ours special than everyone else's? So really f remembering your, your users is very important when we define, when we decide what uh, kind of app we're going to build. Now, this step here is very forgotten, I think, sometimes in the development process. And this goes, I mean, this, this idea comes from even if you're going to start a business, even if you're going to make some kick-ass game like The Last of Us. <laughs> <I'll get. laughs> right, you need to figure out what is your, what, what, for apps, it would be your app definition statement, right? So what defines your app? What is the really focus of your app? Um, it's like the mission statement of your app, okay? It should be a concrete declaration of your app's purpose. Usually it's like two to three sentences. But you're saying, my app does blah, 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 blah. So even if you think about a simple example, well, I think it's, you know, people think, oh, OK, like Facebook. People, everyone uses Facebook. All my students use Facebook. OK, good. Raise a hand. Oh, OK, good. Cross the board. Yay. So Facebook. Think about the Facebook app, OK? It does 
You think about it, it does a lot for you. But what's its app definition statement? Connecting people, sharing information, status, friend, friend, st status, photos with friends. Right? That's it. I mean, that's its core. Right? It might do other things, but that's its core. So we really like to figure out what our core feature set is. And when you do start, you know, you think about your app idea, you may want to have like hundreds of features usually happens, especially with engineers, right? We think, oh, it, it could do this, and it could do that, and it could do this, and it could do that. You really want to focus in on what's the core of it. What's the core of your app? Because that's what you want to get done first. Not all these other side things. You want to get the core done first. So figure out your core feature set. Filter the feature list through that user profile as well. Because if you think, oh, because of my user profile, those features probably won't be used very much, then don't do them yet. Right? Focus on what you want to do. Um, and write out your app definition statement. People say, well, I have an idea of it. Write it out. I make all my students, actually, when they have an app idea, I make them do a proposal. Part of it is the app definition statement, their core features, their user profile, their competitors. It's a one pager, one page. But it defines what their app is easily. And that's what you can also, that's also what we might call our elevator pitch, right? If you meet someone and you're like, I'm working on it, I have a great idea for an app, it does X, Y, Z. Like you can just clearly say it, right? That's what, we do. that's what we do. And then throughout the process, right, design and development, we refer back to it to make sure that we're hitting our focus. We're hitting the core of what we want our app to do, okay? And I know they do that in games as well. Right? They say, what is our real core of our game? Right? If there's extra stuff that we can push aside for now, let's push it aside and let's really focus in on it. So, and write it out, write it out. Print it out. Put it up there. <laughs> Keep it visible. OK, so design. Design is very, very important. And according to like, different things I've read, for mobile apps specifically, they say that design is like 50% of your app. Why 50%? Mobile users are kind of picky. There's a lot of apps out there. If you don't immediately like it, you're just going to delete it. And you're either, you're either going to be lazy and never open it again, or you're actually going to delete it. <laughs> right? Do you have a lot of apps you've never, you've opened like once, right? And you have like pages of it. But yeah, so. You know, design is really important. You want to engage the user right away. And no offense, but sometimes really geeky engineers aren't the best in design. <laughs> Just throwing it out there. <laughs> um, so um, having someone that is good in design can really help you. Um, though there, I've also seen great, I mean, engineers that are really good, great at design too. So don't want to cast everyone with the same brush. Um, and avoid increasing the user's cognitive burden. Basically, don't make your users think. They should be able to open your app and know what to do. It should be familiar to them, right? It sh they should be able to quickly do what they're supposed to do, right? There's a great book by um, Steve Krug. There's been, this is actually, this is the third version that just came out last month, is Don't Make Me Think Revisited. The two previous versions were Don't Make Me Think. Now, he does focus on web usability. That was his, right, he, over the years. Um, but as you know, the, the mobile development as a whole came after web, right? Web, 1990, first web page. <laughs> at CERN, first web page, right? Tim Berners-Lee at CERN, and the CERN guys were here yesterday. Um, uh, you know, we, we, right, mobile development, we steal a lot from web. Um, but really, I like that book because it really teaches you, you know, about focusing in on your users, right, and making it easy for them. Throughout our app, we want to be internally consistent. If we have custom user interface components, we want to make sure that we test them to make sure that it's really easy for our users, right? Give it to your mom. Probably want mom or grandma, that could be like some of the best testing, right, if they can do it. <sighs> right? <laughs> How many of you have to be your mom's IT? You all do, right? See? Yeah. 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 I know. Been there. Um, 
<laughs> or dad recently, my dad recently, yes, just last week. Uh, oh yes, installing Windows 7. There, there's a, there's a touch into the previous <laughs> talk. Um, I, and also we have to design for touch, right? People that come from web development, they're used to, oh, I didn't, I put away my mouse, but the mouse, right? The mouse is very precise, very little. You can do very intricate things with the mouse. We have touch, we have fingers. We call it, you know, fat fingering when you touch is the wrong thing, right? So we really do have to design for touch, right? We don't have as much capability as we do, but I also like touch because it is, it's, it's, it really engages the user more, and it's very direct, right? From a mouse, you know, you're thinking, your hand's moving the mouse, and then something on the screen, whereas touch is very direct, right? So um, it's actually, I think, a much better. Uh, we like to say that really the smallest components for touching should be 44 by 44 pixels. It's a rough estimate. I can tell you numbers for what Microsoft says, what um, Microsoft, what Android says. Generally, that's the iOS, what they say their minimum is, is you sure your components shouldn't be less than 44 by 44, because that's good for the human finger. So keep that in mind as well, okay? And if design is not your strength, do hire someone or partner with someone, right? I don't know if you have a lot of good design. Yeah, at, at USC, we have, you know, a school of art and design, we have a school of um, business. So it's fun to, we try to get student groups together to partner with each other. So uh, I encourage that as well, very much so. Okay, so when it comes to design, the first stage, at least I make my students do, is wireframing. So lay out what your screens are gonna look like. This, com this term actually comes from web, yeah, mobile steals a lot from web. Um, wireframing, we do visual representations of the layout of our apps. It's really the basic flow of your apps. You literally either draw out with tools or with pen and paper, pencil and paper. We like to erase, we're engineers, right? Yeah, we like to erase. Pencil and, and, and paper, and we figure out what our flow is gonna be of our apps. We lay out the major components, you don't have to worry, it's, it's a low fidelity. So it's, it's a, it doesn't have to be beautiful graphics, it's getting the flow of it, getting the ideas out there, right? Um, so there's lots of different, whether you use paper, there's templates, there's a lot of different templates. I have links on my website, which I have at the very end of my uh, presentation. Links for templates for Android, small Android, large Android, iPhone 5, iPhone 4, iPads, tablets, right? So you can print these out and then start drawing. Okay. There's also, if you wanna do uh, lots of tools out there, all these tools have ones as well. Or, and of course there's always just the get to a whiteboard and start drawing too, that's always fun. Then you can use colorful markers, I like that. And erase, you can use color and you can erase, all in one. Um, I, th I know this doesn't look very good, Ooh, it really didn't show up here, but this was, if you can kind of see some templates of some iPhone 5s, and these are from my students, uh, one, of my student, one of my student groups, we're designing an app for the, in conjunction with the LAPD, so the Los Angeles Police Department, um, which is supposed to help inform them, inform drivers in LA what to do in an accident, when they need to call the police, when, what information they need to share, uh, and basically kind of that helping what to do and relieving some of the burden on the police. So this is just a, a start, but you know, we did this just a couple weeks ago and I thought, oh, well, I'll grab that. Um, you know, whether you know, I'm a driver in an accident, what do I do, and it, and it helps take you through. So I know these are really hard to read, but it is, Literally, someone just took a pen and started drawing, right? So it's a great, um, just a, a, an example for you. Um, if you like to use some kind of tool, there's a lot of different tools out there, um, and they, literally, there's ones being developed all the time. Balsamic, mock-ups, you've probably heard of some of, some of them. I really like Balsamic because they give us a free education account, so I, I 
implore you to either contact them or have your professor contact them, and they'll give you free access, right? So it's been great. We've been able to have groups, multiple people in the same group. Like I can make all these different projects for different groups, and students can all log in together and work on their mock-ups. It's been great. They have two different skins. They have one that looks like hand-drawn and one that is straight-lined. So, uh, and there's other ones as well, but I'm putting it out there. Anything that I can help you get free access, I figured that's a good thing, right? <laughs> um, okay, so now let's talk about interactive prototypes. And Balsamic actually does let you do some interactive prototyping as well. But when we get to, like, once we do our wireframes, I, you know, we do wireframe reviews, we show them to students, making sure that it flows well, right? And then we start doing interactive prototypes. Um, where we have more full color, they look like a mobile app, whether it be Android, iOS, we can do specific ones. Um, we're able to create hotspots to mimic what a user would do, like touching, right? You touch this tab and it shows this other screen. You touch this, you touch this button, this other screen comes up. And so we create these interactive prototypes as well so we can do usability testing, right? You can get a group of people and, and test your app out. Um, it really lets us test our interface ideas, reject some that don't work, right? Because that, that's part of the process, right? It is kind of an iterative process. Um, so it's a great way to do that. Now, when it comes to prototyping tools, there's some tools out there where you have to create your own images, and then you can make hotspots on your images and then link it all up. And then you can literally like download it to your phone and then you go through it and touch it, and it brings up the next screens and stuff. Um, there's, so there's some where you have to first create your own images, and there's some that are, are full prototyping tools. So I'm going to go through some of them. For images, for prototyping, right, anything you're used to using. If you're used to using something like Photoshop or Illustrator, go for it. Um, for Photoshop and Illustrator, there are templates available. There's some guys, I have links, that make some great templates. Like, Every single user interface component for iOS, and, and now they have Android as well, they've created in layers. Like you, you, you download this template in Photoshop and you can change words, right? Because it's just a text on some layers, they group them, and it's awesome because you can quickly, with just hiding and showing certain ones, create some really nice looking, um, nice looking uh, prototypes. So, but of course then you're making images, right? So Photoshop Illustrator, of course I'm going to give you one that's free because Adobe keeps on, right? Now they have Adobe, what is it, Adobe 365? No, that's Office 365, Adobe Cloud, right? Now you have to pay per year, right? So, and just Adobe itself can be very expensive. Do they give you an education discount? Sometimes they'll give education discounts. Anyway, it's, it's expensive, it's expensive. So if you can't do that, um, Pencil is also, uh, uh, will create images, and like that one was made just very quickly. You can have different looks of what your mobile phone's gonna be. You have the whole keyboard, all that kind of stuff, and it's free, and it's available on all platforms. So I wanna give you some things that are free as well, okay? Now, for creating hotspots with your images, um, you know, you create hotspots so it actually, it, it feels almost like your app, right? Um, it links the images together. My favorite tool is Flinto, and they've given us an educational discount. I mean, basically, you can have it free for 30 days. Um, I sent a nice email to Flinto saying who I was and that I have a mobile app cla classes, and he said, okay, well, I'll just give you all of your students, their accounts free till the end of the semester, end of the, the school term. So I implore you to ask your professor to send a nice email to Nathan at Flinto, and uh, yeah, and they're broadcasting it live. And they're like, oh, why are all these people from Portugal wanting a free account? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I mean, we've used Envision and other ones as well. Um, but uh, just wanted to put that out there, Flinto, so it's F-L-I-N-T-O, they've been really um, helpful to us. What I like about Flinto is say you have your whole project, you have all these different screenshots, right? All these different screens, you've, you've mapped out what you want to do, you have all these links, all these hotspots, say you want to change a screen. 
All you have to take your new image, just drop it in. All the hot link, all the links, all the hot spots are, are saved. You just drop it in and it does it all. You don't have to recreate hotspots. That's why I really like Flinto, just so you know. Um, there's other great um, interactive prototyping tools. Um, so, and remember, these interactive prototyping tools, they will let you like download them on your phone or give you a, a, a web link. So you could give to your customers or other people so they could test out your app, right? So it's a great way to demo it. Um, and we've, we've used Fluid UI as well. They gave us an educational discount. It wasn't free, but they gave us a discount. It's a web-based tool. They have all the templates for you know, Android, iOS, that kind of stuff. So it looks just like at the keyboards, just look at, you just literally drag and drop, you can make hotspots, all that kind of stuff. So that's been a really uh, great tool to use. Axure as well, they gave us complete educational access as well. And it creates more of an HTML like website mock-up and, and you can click on it. You can even put some logic, some conditional logic in it to do different things as well. So that's, that's been great as well. And then there's other time, and other, other tools as well. Um, so part of the design, make sure you think about what your app icon's gonna be, right? Think about a good name for your app and what your app icon's gonna be. I, gr I had this slide with like all these rules and then I, I found this image and I thought, it has all of my things except for the last one, I created the last one. Um, remember your app icon, right? This is that, the, the image that people will see on their phone, right? Um, no text. The name is always at the bottom by the operating system. Don't put text in your, you really try, should try not to put any text in your, especially down the road, you want, to, you want it to be localized, right? right? Whereas an app icon is just an image that you give to the app stores. It should be your main character, or your main theme, Right uh, now, this of course was for a game, <laughs> but it's a ninja, if you can tell. Um, but it's really that main character or whatever kind of your main image. Uh, no extra symbols. There's a nice con contrasting background. We don't put the gloss on it, right? In iOS six and before that extra like drop thing was done by iOS. You didn't put that. You actually in iOS you make square images. You do not round the corners. They round the corners for you. You give them a square width equals, width equals height image, right? Um, you don't put gloss, and I say no inner transparency. So in iOS, you want absolutely no transparency, right? That alpha channel where things see through. Think about it, if we had app icons that had transparency, what would happen? our background would bleed through, right? Wouldn't that be really, you, you wouldn't be able to see them, right? Now, Android's a little bit different because you can have transparency, but what you wanted is around the edge. So you can have something that's not square. I mean, all images, of course, are square. All images have a width and a height, well, a rectangular width and height, uh, officially. Uh, app icons should be square. Um, but you don't, want the trans you don't want the transparency inside, you can have it on the outside. So you can have some shape, right, so it's transparent around, but not on the inside. So uh, part of the design process is a good app icon, because it, it, it grabs your users, right, especially on the app store. If you're not really good at it, hire someone. Um, also, the look of it, the overall look of it, whether it be your palette, your main colors that you want, right? Usually they map kind of towards, of course, what's in your app icon, right? Um, but you want to create your own look. You probably want to use your own font style, right? You can use your own fonts, um, character style, whatever that may be, and your color palette. So what is the overall colors? You can use other colors in your apps, but it's like defining what are the main colors, right? We do that in any kind of design, right? Um, I threw up there the USC color palette. So if we ever do anything, website, mobile apps for USC, my school, those are the colors we use. RGB values and hex values. There you go. <laughs> nice as a reference. Okay, and then design. I, of course, I teach a lot in iOS. So I, I do kind of, 
come from that side versus the Android side. Um, but in iOS 7, which actually maps really well to Windows, it, kind of the Windows design, right? The Windows design kind of comes from the metro tiles, right? The tiles, they're changing. But it's a very flat design, right? We, we now have these more, like our images are more flat. They are more simple, right? They're not realistic like they used to be, right? But there's a lot of layering going on. So your background is like back here, and then, and then all your apps, app icons are on this layer, right? And you can even, when you move, it looks, right? So there's this, this flatness, but there's this layering, right? So that's really the kind of um, purpose, right, of iOS 7. That's really the, the real difference. And it really matches well with Windows, uh, Windows Metro Tile design as well, OK? So I tell them, you know, we're now focusing more on, right, and when it comes to iOS 7, like, our animations and stuff are more realistic, right? They have this physical um, skeuomorphism versus a, versus a visual skeuomorphism. Right, so we, we went away from, you can see some of those apps where, like even on the notes, you can see right here, I'll, I'll, I'll use the laser pointer. You can see here on, on uh, this is iOS 6, there was like a little torn paper here, right? There's like a little extra little, like you tear it, and then it's gone here, right? We went to very simple, whereas this is very, more realistic. Even like photos, it was like, oh, it looks like a flower, and now we just have colors, right? So, you know, that's, that's the whole idea. Right, so we're gonna we go more with that kind of design. So a lot of app icons are changing as well, right? And the really, if you think about it, the, the simpler ones are easy to spot, right? When you look at your phone and you're like, oh, I want to do that app, right? You want one that's easy to spot. So there you go. That's kind of on the design side as well. Um, so the cost for design, in case you're not really good at design, um, I will throw it out there. I know these are U.S. prices, so you can convert them into euros. I guess divide by something. I don't know, whatever it is. What is it? One to 1.3 something right now? I don't know. Anyway. But just so you know, uh, we, for just even just designing a mobile app, um, sometimes you're going to want to use a graphic designer if, 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 if that's not your strong point. So now let's get into the development of apps. Because, and this is like something that some people kind of forget about is when we develop apps, the first thing I want to say is, OK, what kind of technology, what kind of app are you going to create? And this is from a technology perspective. And even, I have to say that even the innovation awards that's coming up after this, right? we had some web apps, some Android apps, some native apps. Uh, for the games, I'm assuming some of them were cross-compiled, right? So they could have been apps or websites, but they were cross-compiled. So I like to break up, technology-wise, the types of apps into web apps, native, and cross-compiled. And then talk about different tools and such for each of them. And someone will say, well, I don't know which type to use. Sometimes it depends on what the whole goal of your app is. So a lot of times people will say, well, I just want an app that, you know, I have a, I have a company and I just want to get my name out there or, you know, be able to tell what kind of services I provide, my hours of operation, something like that. Well, web apps are great for that, right? You don't, they don't need to download it from an app store. It's free. Um, it's, like I said, it's great for marketing. So web apps is, is, is where we use technology like HTML5, CSS3, JavaScript, and then, you know, we pull in a lot of different uh, Java fra uh, not, uh, JavaScript frameworks and stuff that we use, um, like Node.js that you were having a, a workshop on, right? We'll use a lot of that here. So it's pros, right? Don't need to use an app store. Quick delivery, you put it on your web server. All your customers immediately have it updated. There are some cons. You'll get performance issues. And of course, you have to have an internet connection, right? So if you, if you want to develop an app that can be used anywhere, you know, that you really don't need an internet connection for, think about like even just as simple as your notes app. Right? Your notes app, you don't need an internet connection for that. You're just saving it locally. It's yours, you're saving it locally. So that wouldn't be a good web app. But a lot of these other companies would be. 
uh, you know, if you're doing something to like market a company. Um, those are really good ideas for web apps. When it comes to web apps, don't forget the most important responsive web design. Supposedly, I read an article, I don't know if you knew this, 2013 was the year of responsive web design. Do you know that? That's what, that's what they said. Anyway. Um, so responsive web design, make sure um, that, you know, your, that your site, right, your website basically, will respond to different devices, right? So media being the different devices, right? I'm sure, I've, hopefully you've heard this term before and, and okay, good. Hands, heads are shaking, don't need to explain it, but there, there's just an image to kind of show you, okay? So important responsive web design when it comes to web apps. And even websites these days, any website, you're gonna do a responsive web design, okay? Kills me when sites aren't responsive. I'm like, really, really? It's 2014. We already passed the year of responsive web design. Get on it. Okay, so native apps. Next, of course, is native apps. And this is like probably most of the apps that you probably use every day are native apps. Well, except for if you're into gaming, because most of those are cross-compiled. But um, native apps built for a specific platform. So we build one. We create an app for iOS. We create an app for Android, different versions of Android. Uh, we create one for BlackBerry, Windows. Yeah, I still, I still kept up BlackBerry. There you go. <laughs> I know they're struggling, but you know, <laughs> still put them in there. Um, so, and of course, these apps are available with different marketplaces. Of course, there, there are more than just that for Android apps, but Google Play is the main one that Google wants you to go to. There's Windows Store, BlackBerry World, and of course, Apple's App Store. So this is kind of my specialty in the fact that I teach kids how to develop iOS apps, mainly. Um, so the great thing is it is the fastest. You have the best performance in native apps. You have access to all the unique features of the phone quickly, right? Whether it be the accelerometer, gyroscope, um, the phone, of course, though that's like the least used <laughs> feature on your phone. How funny is that? The phone. Um, <laughs> it's a smartphone and it's the least used feature. Um, <laughs> uh, all the, anything that's special, right? The camera, taking video, right? So it, it's the easiest to access all those components. So if you do have an app, you're deciding on an app and it's gonna need that kind of interaction very quickly, right? reading the accelerometer motion, um, taking pictures. Native apps really are a great way to go. Um, it is also great if you're charging for your app, if you're, whether it be, we're gonna talk more about monetization, but whether you're having users pay to download your app or buy, buy uh, purchases within your app. There is some cons, right? You have to have an Android version, an iOS version, a Windows version, a black, <laughs> um, and you have to deal with like the different sizes of all the Android devices, right? All that kind of stuff. So it, I mean, it, it is, it, there are some cons, but there are some actually good stuff about it as well. Um, I know that there's companies like Zynga where like for one game, they'll have an Android team and an iOS team. So they'll have separate teams that are doing the same game, but there's the Android version and the iOS version, because they're, they're, they're writing it natively, right? Do you remember the time that Facebook had their app where it was web-based, mainly web-based, and they didn't write it native, and it was really, really slow, really slow. And then they ended up writing two versions, or more than two versions, but at the time it was just mainly iOS and Android. So, you know, here's the major languages, so if you, come from CS and you're like, oh, you know, if you come from, you have a good Java background, start with Android. If you have a really good C, C++ background, start with Objective-C. Um, and then of course, or Windows, there you go. Um, <laughs> I know people at Microsoft, I shouldn't say anything. <laughs> um, and then of course, your IDEs, your, your different, um, these are the main ones. Now, as you know, you can use different toolkits. 
I had someone who said, well, I know Python, and I want to write an iOS app. My coworker and I, we tried to, or he tried, he was trying to use this certain framework to take Python code and turn it into an iOS app. It was painful, painful. I thought, just write Objective-C. <laughs> just go with the language that you should. Um, so I'm a big one on teaching like the core fundamentals of Objective-C so they can write really fast, efficient iOS apps. And the same with Android apps as well, right? That's, that's my feeling. Um, here's the developer sites. Now, if you've done any development, you probably know these sites very well. Um, I was wondering, is I, IST part of the um, Apple's university program? No. no? OK, so we're, USC is part of the university program. And I, I was there from the beginning when we put in our paperwork back in 2008 to be part of the university program. And it's a great program to be part of because my students can put their apps on their own devices. And they don't have to pay that $99. You know, if you want to be an iOS developer, you have to pay $99 to put it on your phone. You don't. And it's free. You just have to have someone, so get some professor who's into, really into Apple or iOS apps, and get him to sign up for the university program, because it has to come usually from the university. Um, and it's a great program because, like I said, the students get access to all the documentation on the Apple website, all that kind of stuff, right? So think about, think about who you can wrangle to, to do that. Um, I think it's well worth it. So just putting it out there. <laughs> um, OK. Uh, and when it comes to, I'm throwing in some other technical tools as well, just that um, my students and I have used in our, in our classes uh, to, to develop apps and to test apps to get it out there. Um, so back end as a service. There's so many times, right? Your app needs to hold data. It needs to hold login data. Even if you're using Facebook to log in, right? You're using the Facebook login. You have to have a Facebook account log in you're still want to, going to want to save information specific to every, all of your users. Well, you need some kind of database, some kind of back end to save that information. So uh, yes, AWS is great, but, but well, I'm seeing. <laughs> um, but you have to pay up front to even just be able to use it, right? Where a lot of these tools here are free. To, to use it to test it out. And it isn't until you, you have tens of thousands of users or, or certain um, events coming, you know, certain s small amount of time that it's free to you guys. So you can get your ideas out there, right? So Firebase, we, we have mainly used Firebase and Parse. So I wanted to put that out there as tools for you guys to, to get your apps up quickly, you know, and to have that back end built for you. And it will expand as you expand, and then if you really expand, you can pay, OK? So throwing that out there for you for development. Um, I also threw up some of our third-party resources that we tend to use a lot in, in my students when we're developing apps. Um, I really like, for, I know this is iOS, sorry, this is where I come from. Um, Coco's Controls is a great website. And you know, we're computer scientists, engineers, right? If someone's done something really well, why should we redo it, right? Use frameworks and templates out there that we can use, right? We're, I like to say that as engineers, we're efficient. Not lazy, efficient, right? We're not lazy, but you know, efficient. So there's a lot of great like uh, GUI controls and stuff at Cocos Controls, okay? And then here's some other great blogs that are really helpful. Worst comes to worst, of course, post a, a question on Stack Overflow. <laughs> of course. OK. So now let's talk about cross-compiled apps. So a lot of gamers, right, if you want to create games, a lot of you will be interested in using some of these tools. Uh, most probably Unity, right? You guys get to use Unity. Cocos 2D, that's a really popular one as well. Um, Unreal, you can see um, other ones as well. Um, so these will create cross-platform. So you build in their, you develop in their tool, and then you can build an iOS executable, basically an iOS app, 
or a Android app. So these are some great tools to use. Of course, there could be additional costs. There is a larger download size. So for your users, there's going to be a larger download size, right? Because they've had to wrap up some of their stuff in it. So uh, just know that, and there can be, it can be lower performance than creating a native app. But I'm putting it out there as uh, tools you know, handy that, that you guys can, can do. Um, now, I want to talk a little bit, so, you know, I get, always get the question, should I create an iOS app or an Android app? It's kind of up to you. Hopefully, if your app is successful, you'll want it on all platforms, right? But I do want to talk about kind of the money side of things, right? So, as you know, there are far more Android devices out there than, I, than Apple. Way more, way more, right? If there's at least, they have, well, just Google Play has 70, almost 75% of the market share when it comes to smartphones, okay? Huge, right? Apple only has like 18, right? Just 18%, small percent, right? So you can see that from here, right? So Google, way more devices out there. Android, I should say, in general. Android, way more devices out there. Not as many Apple devices. But where's money being made? On a daily basis, even with this small share, on a daily basis, the daily revenue is over five million for iOS apps. Daily basis. Where in Android, it's just over one million. So even though Android has more of the market share, a huge amount more of the market share, more money is spent on iOS apps, in iOS apps, for iOS apps, in-app in app purchases. So that is something to think about when you go to do your app. If you really want to make money at it, right, you'll probably want to do both markets. But notice that this is the one where more money is being made, OK? So let's talk about money, because this is, I think, a topic also that kind of gets forgotten, is, oh, I'm going to create this wonderful app that does X, Y, Z, and I'm going to put it out there for free on the App Store. And I say, how are you going to make money at it, right? Because, you know, I, I, want engineer, I want software developers to be successful in the fact that they can, you know, pay for food and a house and, and such, housing and such. So, I know this really sounds like a bad joke, but two app developers walk into a bar. I know. One has a free app, and one charges $4.99. Who makes more money at it? Free. The free guy. Really, see, you guys already know this. The free guy, right? There's plenty of successful paid apps out there, but really, the free apps are the ones that are making more money. And you say, how? How? There's lots of different monetization strategies. I want to cover some of those so you know what some of them are, in case you don't know, right? Because this is the business side that you don't always think about, right? Um, so the easiest way is, right, users paying for your apps. Um, but, right, advertisers can pay you, the developer, to display ads. Users can pay within the app to do different activities, get extra stuff. Um, and or like companies could pay as well. I think about uh, David Hodge and his Embark company where Apple bought him out. So <laughs> there's other, right? Because their customer, and part of it is the customer base is what, it could be technology that's important, right? Or, or WhatsApp, um, the, the WhatsApp, right? The WhatsApp app, right? It just sold for. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Right? It's because of their customer base, right? That's really what they're paying for. So if you can get enough, enough people using your app, someone will pay, may pay for that as well. Okay? So, yeah, I know, crazy. Uh, paid apps, easiest, most straightforward way to monetize apps. You see your earnings right away, but you really do have to work harder to get people to download it in the first place. Right, you really have, you end up having to pay a lot, sometimes a lot for marketing just to get people to download your app. So when it comes to free apps, there's really two ways ultimately that, well, not, these are the two main ways specifically for your app immediately versus if you're going to sell your 
your app down the road to another company. Um, so reality, really no one likes to pay apps, pay for the apps. So, but in the end, you can either have advertisers pay you or you can have users pay you. So your users either pay or advertisers pay. When it comes to advertising, right, you see the display ads, um, know some of the figures. I mean, 1.6 billion on mobile ads in 2011, that's nothing, I think, I, I need to get the latest statistics, but it's just been growing every year. Um, it's, um, you know, the display ads could be from little tiny banners to whole screen shots in between levels or whatever it may be. Um, but here's, and here's the three different kind of ad models. And these actually come from web. So of course, mobile came after web. We steal a lot of their stuff, uh, web development stuff. So here's the three main mobile ad models. And because you may not know this, right? You may just think, oh, I'm just going to display ads. But actually, there's different types. So one is the cost per click. So you display ads, but you only get paid when one of your users clicks on that ad. Because it's something that's easy to, to track. Okay, so that's one way. Um, and, you know, users can inadvertently click on it. Um, though I will say that uh, Google's Larry Page is very hopeful that um, the cost per clicks will rise. He thinks it will rise on mobile. We'll see. Um, so that's one way to get paid. Another way is just by displaying ads. So you get paid for every thousand times you pl you display an ad. Okay, so that's the cost per mill, or the or we call it cost per mill, or sometimes we call it cost per thousand, but really it's CPM. So, um, so that's what we call just an impression. It's like just impressions, right? Just throwing ads out there. So that's what you get paid. Now, this is the one that advertisers really like: is the cost per action, and that's where you display an ad. You advertisers like this. Developers don't always like this. But it's you get paid when a user actually clicks and does some action, whether it may be downloading that app, right, or registering on a website, something like that. You know, doing something more than just, it's, it's like you're, there's some really specific action tied to that ad. So this is what advertisers like to do because then they don't have to pay unless someone actually really, you know, they, they got this retention from the, from the user. They got, you know, they really, they really got them to do something. Because um, it takes, you have to display a lot of these before someone will actually click through it. Okay? So, um, but, uh, you know, displaying ads, you know, we partner with advertisers, like Waze partners with retailers and merchants. So they'll display certain ones that are local to you, like Google does the same, right? All that kind of stuff. Um, advertisers pay approximately, you know, two dollars per cost per click, ten dollars for every displaying it a thousand times, you know, displaying an ad, and on average twenty dollars for every cost per action. But you don't always know how many times you're going to have to do an impression for that. So, but these are the, the rough figures, so you know um, what what advertisers are going to pay. There's lots of different. Um, Companies out there, you've probably heard of some of them. I threw them up there, like AdMob, TapJoy, right? So you work with them. They can actually gear your the ads, right? They have they've made com they've made business uh, agreements with lots of companies, so they can even gear your ads to your users, right? Part of your user profile, you know who your users are going to be. They'll gear the ads towards you, towards you as well. Right, towards your users. Because, you know, really, you don't want to get ads that aren't apropos to, to, your, to your users. Now, this, of course, is the best way to make money in mobile ads is the freemium model. So if that's the business model where the consumer receives services for free, but if they want extra stuff, they, it's premium, right? They smash the words together, free and premium. We get freemium, yes. In technology, well, anywhere, right? We, we like to make up our own words. I didn't make this word up, though. <laughs> um, so this is a common business model that is used. Um, people are really more willing to pay for services in an app if they've downloaded and played with it and they're happy with it, right? 
So there's different, uh, different examples, right? You could have light versions. You've probably seen like cut the rope. That was a common one that had a light version where you could have certain amount of levels, but then you paid for it and you got a whole bunch of different levels, right? Um, Live Strong's calorie tracker, they had a light version and then a, a premium version. Uh, there's also like the subscription update. So does anyone here use Evernote? So Evernote, right, great for organizing all your stuff. Um, so they use a premium, they have this subscription model, right, so you can pay more, right, and then it will save things, be able to sync them up, everything like that. So lots of different, you, could probably, you, could, you yourself could probably think of lots of different examples. Um, In-app purchases, right, so purchases made within a mobile app, very popular. Of course, like Zynga, right, they have tons of apps. I know, I know a lot of people that work at Zynga, so I tend to use them as an example, sorry. Um, they, you know, where you buy tokens of virtual currency, um, Dragon Veil, that was a game that my kids loved for a while. It's like Farm, Farmville for dragons. Yes. It was, it was a top grossing app for a while, back like a year and a half ago. Um, uh, but one thing I want you to notice about um, a lot of these, these in-app purchases, especially when it comes to games, you know, you're buying these virtual goods and there's never a one-to-one -one mapping. So you buy a bag of gems for 99 cents. It's not like that buys you, you know, you use that and then buy more stuff. Then you can enable more stuff in the game. Um, even you think about coins, like, uh, a uh, friend of ours um, has grab games, and he does a lot of these poker slot games. And so you can, um, you know, add in more coins and stuff. It's never a one to one. It's not like 99 cents gets you one coin or even 10 coins. There's always this off, right? It's not an even mapping on purpose. So you kind of don't know how much your users are spending. Yeah, good psychology going on there, right? Um, Let's see, in-app purchases, really this is where things are going. They project that in 2016, that in-app purchases revenues will reach $4.8 billion. <coughs> These are virtual goods, people. These don't even really exist. I mean, you buy a bag of coins in a game. It's not like someone mails you a bag of coins. It's virtual goods and people are paying. So. Um, this is the way that people are making money with their mobile apps, right? And it doesn't necessarily have to be like, you know, games, right? You think about games, but it doesn't always have to just be games. It could be you're adding more services, right? So I have some students who are working on a, a splitting, the, splitting the check or the, um, what, a, con a conta, right, when you ask for the check. <laughs> um, being able to like divide it up with your, your friends, right? Saying, this is yours, this is mine, how are we gonna pay for it, and stuff like that. Well maybe, you know, they're thinking about monetization, like you can do so many per week or per month, but if you wanna do more, you have to pay. So it doesn't have to be this straight, easy, right, you know, um, you can be creative with how you do your in-app purchases. Right? You could have, you can do some action for so many times, but then after you hit some threshold, then the user has to pay, right? Because they really like it. They really like to use it, so then they're willing to pay. So think about, I mean, be creative with some of these ideas on how to get your users to pay for services within your app. Um, so really this is a great way. It's really the best of both worlds. It's how people are making money Top five grossing apps are all free apps and they use in-app purchases. It, users aren't, they don't get the hard sell. It's not like you have to spend money to use my app. They get to try your app and then if they really like it, they can pay for things, okay? So really that is a, a great way to go. Um, the cost, uh, so now I just wanna overall talk a little bit about the cost of, um, of developing apps, right? So we're, talked about kind of the cost of marketing, but I wanted to mention some of the, the costs in developing apps that developers kind of forget about sometimes. 
So, um, and here's just an infographic that you can kind of see, you know, I always get the question, how much does it cost to develop an app? I'm like, well, <laughs> what is your app going to do? What kind of back-end services does it need? What, you know, there's a lot of things that, you know, that it depends on. So, you know, that's something to look at, whether it's really easy, whether you want in-app purchases, whether you want to do um, hook-in with social networking, which is a great thing to do, all these kind of things. So you can see some here, some of the costs um, that are, that, um, that will um, occur when developing apps. But this is a cost that I think people forget about, is that once you deliver your app, once you put it out there on the app store, you're really not done. Because do we make perfect software? It's hard to make perfect software. There's bugs, right? You get users using your stuff, they're going to find bugs. So we will have to do updates. But you actually want to do updates. Because updates, like you get notified when there's updates. And when you update your app, then users will want to download it and look at it again, right? Especially if you're, you want to add new features. It's a common is that you get the core features implemented, you put it out there, and then you do updates, adding more and more features, right? So just notice that oh, there are continuing costs as once you've developed your apps. So put some of this stuff out there um, so you can kind of see that, okay? Whether it's new platforms, all that kind of stuff. Um, I also want to talk about marketing. Because that's also something that kind of gets forgotten sometimes, is how are you going to do some marketing? You may have the best app in the world, but if no one knows about it, you're not going to, well, no one's going to use it, and you're not going to make any money, right? So the old way of marketing is the outbound marketer. That's the traditional, let me throw some commercials up, let me throw some ads, let me send it in the mail or display it. That's what we call the outbound marketer, where you're just kind of putting it out there. The best way is the inbound marketing. This is the newer way to, um, to market your any kind of, whether it's web stuff, games, mobile apps, right? And even regular companies are doing this as well, is we want it to be more of this communication between our customers. Um, we, want, you know, we want it to provide value to them. So I just threw this chart up there because I think it's interesting as time goes by. You know, people, they spend, so this is supposed to be like spending time on, on watching television, right, which is the traditional just display some ads. Um, but then mobile, people watching, so are, are just consumption of minutes per day. People over time are spending more and more time in mobile applications. Are you watching your... TV shows and movies, right, and mobile apps these days. We are, we, right? No, you still go back home, sit in your living room. No, computer, not really. Like oh, computer, okay. Computer, tablets. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But generally, what are the, like, do you have like ne Netflix? No, 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 okay. I don't know what you have here. <laughs> nothing, nothing. I'm sorry, I'm really sorry. Netflix is great. <laughs> Great. Gotta watch House of Cards. It's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. Anyway, so, um, so, you know, when it comes to marketing our mobile app, you have to be social, tell your own story, court your audience from the, from the beginning. So I wanted to just show you some of these, you know, being social. Um, the twi there's an example. Um, Nike. Nike had a mobile app. And they, uh, so they had, um, they just, they did their regular outbound marketing. But one thing they did is they said, oh, well, on a side note, let's just tweet about it. Let's tweet a lot about it and see what happens. And they actually got the, basically the same number of customers both ways. And the, and the, the Twitter was really just an experiment, they said, right? And they had a really high ROI, so return on investment. They spent very little money tweeting, right, or even paying for their tweets to be promoted, right, promoted by, and they got just as many customers doing the more expensive traditional way with, you know, 
even commercials and all that kind of stuff, paying to be shown at different times. So there's a lot of examples like that where it's really important to do that kind of stuff. Um, Facebook, if your app connects with Facebook, like, hey, log in with Facebook, right? People will tend to spend more time in your app, amazingly. Right? So there's statistics about that here, where you know if you are, you can see here. So the blue is logged in with Facebook, the red is not logged in. And so if your if if your users logged in with Facebook, they're more apt to stay and spend more time in your app. Okay, so that that gets more engagement. Um, telling your own story, right? Um, we want to make sure from the beginning that we select the right name, that it really tells what we want. Memorable icon, your app icon, it needs to really show what your app is doing. Um, you can experiment with the categories and keywords for your apps as well. That's part of when you put it up to an app store, you get to put in their keywords and select the categories where your app matches. So you can really do that. Um, and your description, right? Hopefully, hopefully you wrote such the best app definition statement that it leads right into the description of your app, hopefully, right? Because your app definition statement tells the core features of your app, right? So hopefully that's what you're gonna use as your description on the App Store, okay? And here is a statistic to remind you. So you can see here, this is about what extent do you trust the following forms of advertisement? So if you see here, this is, you, you'll probably agree to this, right? What do you trust? Do you, rec you trust recommendations from people you know, right? If someone says, hey, I really like this movie, or I really like this video game, right? You're like, oh, okay, I like the stuff you like, yes, I'm gonna like it, right? You're more apt to trust that, right? Or consumer opinions online. Do you use Yelp and that kind of stuff here? Do you have your own? Okay. But, or even Amazon, do you go on Amazon and you see recommendations? Okay, good, an example that, that works. <sighs> Amazon, um, you know, you trust those more. Now you look at here, emails I signed up for. Basically from this point on is all that outbound marketing, right? Ads that are just projected at you versus inbound marketing, right? So that's, that's what works better. It, what, it really what works better for, for, to get your users, right? Another thing, make sure that your app, your description, it do, your app does what you say it does, right? You don't want negative reviews, even in app stores. At least you probably do that, right? Reviews in app stores, right? You look at those, especially if you're an Android user. If you're an Android user, you have to look at those because, right, there isn't that security check. There isn't as much of that security check. There's no one testing the app before it gets out there. So you really have to look at those reviews to make sure that it does what it says it does and there's no weird stuff going on, right? Right, you know, you know. So um, you have to be very truthful in what you say your app does so people will download it. And disclose any key information, all that kind of stuff. It needs to be uh, very, uh, very clear. Um, okay. Um, so I do want you to think about what is your marketing plan, right? If you have a website, do you have a link? Say, hey, download our app. If you have a Twitter account, email list, Facebook page, are you putting it out there, right? That's an easy, cheap way to market your stuff. Um, but, you know, app stores really are the primary way that apps are discovered. So there are ways, right? So make sure you have a great title. Use appropriate keywords, descriptions, and screenshots. Don't put your login screenshot up on the App Store. Everyone has a login. I mean, if you log in, right? If your app requires you to log in, yes, log in, there's what? You want to pick the screenshots that really show the main purpose of your app, the really interesting, fun part of your app, right? I, I hate going to the App Store and you're like, but that doesn't, that, what, what, right? Get really good screenshots out there. And there's also, another big way is app store optimization, right? Getting your app to be used and then up the list, right? Top 50, top five, C, 
seeing if you're across the banner, right? That's where you're going to see the increase of downloads. Okay? And of course, we want our customers, our users, to leave reviews as well. So build it into your app such that if they've used it so many times or for so long, ask them to write a review. Make it easy for them. Okay. So I want you to notice that there's all this kind of stuff for your strategy. Yes, you're going to use word of mouth, social media, web advertising, all that kind of stuff. You're going to want to use app store optimization and mobile advertising, right? You're going to want to use all of that to try to get your app noticed, right? Get it out there. Now, a big thing what your app needs, right? Your app needs users, right? We need to reach people. So hopefully marketing will reach people. Then we want them to do more than just download it and open it once. So we want the retention. We want people to keep on reusing our apps. And then we want to make money from them, right? So reach, retention, revenue. Reach, retention, revenue. Remember that. That's how you're going to get a successful app. Reach, retention, revenue. I like alliterations, by the way. Um, so part of that is figuring out how many people are downloading our apps. You can get that generally just from the app store. But you want more than that. How much time are they spending on your app? Are we getting them to convert such that they are spending money in our app, right? So part of that is analytics. Um, so you know, doing the, the you know, easy analytics is just the science of analysis, right? So analyzing uh, different stuff going on specifically to mobile apps. We care about tracking a whole bunch of data. Right, tracking events, all that kind of stuff. There are lots of tools out there, software that will help you track events, uh, report events, um, and, all, and then they'll have usually some kind of service that's web-based, so you can see how many, how many users you have, how much money they've spent, or how much time they're in certain sections of your app, all that kind of stuff. I like to break up those kind of what we call metrics into three categories. And the three categories are acquisition and user metrics, so how many downloads, new users, all that kind of stuff. And there's some tools out there that you can incorporate that are really, really good at the metrics, okay? That are good at that kind of metrics. But that's it. We want engagement metrics. We want to know, right, retention, are they coming back and opening it back up again? Crashes, boo, we don't want crashes. Um, and conversion, are they actually converting? Are they actually then spending money in our app, right? So, and then from here, like we want outcome metrics, app sales, in-app purchases, how much money are they spending? And from that, we can figure out a whole bunch of, right, there's, there's a, I, I want, I say this because a lot of people will just put in tools that will worry about maybe the first and partly the second, but they forget about the third. And if you guys want, you, you have an app out there. You, you have a small audience, but you have an app out there. And you want it to grow. And you need more money, capital to come in. You want investors, right, so you can actually really build up your app. Investors care about the last one. They want to know how much money you're making to see the potential. And not just that, investors specifically care about these bottom two, which was mentioned in one of the uh, lectures yesterday. Right? Um, ARPU and ARPU-PU. Yes, we actually say ARPU and ARPU-PU. You know, geeky people and acronyms, right? We don't say GUI, we say GUI, right? We have weird, you know. Well, those aren't, but don't we love our TLAs, our three letter acronyms? Right? A three, I don't know. Okay. Well, there's some TLAs right up at the top. So, um, we really care about, so we care about like daily active users. Per day, how many active users do we have? How many monthly active users do we have? And then this is a, a also really important figure to know is the ratio of daily active users divided by monthly active users. This is what investors want to know as well if they want to invest in you so you can grow. Because they want to know, you know that ratio. How many times you know, are they coming back just once a month? Or are you just getting some people to come back? Or are you getting, getting them back? I want you to know that 20% is a great figure. If you can get your app up to 20%, so 20% of your users, right, that is great. Um, so, 
and like I said, they really care about average revenue per user. So out of all your users, what's the average revenue? Did you know that really there's only a smaller section of people that are spending a lot of money? It's not like it's even across the board. You're going to have a whole bunch of people. It's kind of like the 80-20 rule, <laughs> right? You're going to have a lot of people not spending money, and then, but you're going to get that, the ones that spend a lot. And so the R poo poo really helps tell that. It's, I know, I know, laugh, it's okay. My 10-year-old would think it's hilarious. Both our boys, our 7 and 10-year-old, hilarious. Um, average revenue per paying user, right? So they really want to know how much are they spending per paying user, okay? Lots of different analytics out there. Uh, you probably heard of Flurry. Flurry, you create events. It's great for figuring how much time people are spending in certain aspects of your, of your app. But make sure you do the money analytics, OK? That is a big one. So I'm going to throw it out there because I know the uh, owner of Grab Analytics, um, Anthony Borges. He's a great guy. Um, they created a company that does uh, analytics, and they, it, they really got the money stuff really down well. The, the R poo. So I'm going to also just say, I, I kind of wanted to close with some of the best practices. Remember, design is really, really important when it comes to mobile apps. Mobile users are finicky. They'll just stop using your app if it doesn't really grab them, if it, you don't have a really good user experience. Um, so if you're not good at, if you're not good at graphics, hire a graphic artist or partner with one. Design for touch and mind, right? A lot of people come from web, and then they're like having little arrows to click, and like, no, 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 we swipe in mobile. We don't click arrows to go that way and that, we swipe. Remember that. Um, monetize, you want to make money with your apps, right, hopefully. So think about monetizing your apps from the beginning. What kind of stuff, you know, whether it be services, that kind of advertising, really advertising. And remember, when it comes to these strategies, you can use multiple strategies. It's not an all or, no, I'm just going to do advertising or I'm just going to do in-app purchases. You can mix it up, right? Uh, don't forget about tablets. Really, tablets are a, a big growing market. So if you have a really good app, make sure that you develop it for tablets as well. Okay, it's a big growing market, especially in the, like, over 50 range of people. There's a lot of people that are buying tablets for their parents and grandparents because they can do email, see pictures, and not have to manage a whole operating system, right? It's, it helps with the, you know, not having to be the IT person, right? You're just like, here, you can't break this. <laughs> hopefully. Um, <laughs> hopefully. Um, so, um, and when it comes to launching your app too, a lot of people will do a soft launch first, which means that you launch your app, but it's not like you put out all the publicity for it. It may be a targeted market. Like um, even um, Tiago from Miniclip was talking about how they soft launched in Canada on Android first. And um, I've talked to people in Zynga, and that's what they do as well, is um, they usually soft launch in like um, Australia or New Zealand, and they use Android. They test out, they get all those bugs fixed, right? All that user feedback, and then they go and do their, you know, their really like publicity launch, right? Um, and iOS, especially iOS, because iOS people, they're more willing to pay, so it has to be good, right? Um, and don't forget, I know that you guys here, I hopefully won't forget, but the whole idea of internationalization and localization, right? Just quick, I threw up, I, I do a whole lecture on it. So, um, but, you know, internationalization being the, the fact that you design your app such that you can facilitate other languages, this is a great way, I mean, from the beginning, if you think about internationalization and then localizing it for different countries, different languages. Um, and, you know, when you localize, it's not just the text that comes up, right, words and such that comes up, but even how we do currency, right? I'm used to the dollar, a number, and then decimal, a, a, a period, and then here we have commas, kind of throws me. We use commas for a thousand or a million or a billion, right? So um, if you localize it, it can really, you know, it can it, it'd be more comfortable for your users. And, it, you know, it, Really, you're, you're, you're dropping a big opportunity if you don't localize it for other countries, right? 
I mean, you, you, you can do it in 40 different languages. So go for it. Um, so just so you know, email, Twitter, LinkedIn. Um, I'm going to put up my web page as well. I've got lots of resources I talk about. I actually have lots of my uh, examples for my classes I put up on my web page. I do iOS development and advanced iOS development, and I also do mobile app technology. So kind of like what we talked about here, kind of the business of, of developing your mobile apps um, from idea to development to uh, business plan to you know, getting in front of investors. So I'll throw that up there for you guys as well. So thank you.